grab your Bibles, go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. Ephesians chapter 4, starting in verse 17. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their hearts, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But ye have not so learned Christ. If so be that ye have heard him and have been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, that ye put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that ye put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, lay aside, put aside lying. Let every man speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands the thing which is good that he may have to give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you yes. with all malice. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Paul has been talking to us about really multiple things, but they fall into three basic groupings as you go through the book of Ephesians. There are the blessings that the believer experiences in the first three chapters. It's, it's about sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. It's about receiving the forgiveness and redemption of the blood of Jesus Christ, the peace that God brings into you, being a part of, of the building of God, where we're fitly framed together and founded on the apostles and prophets, uh, about having an experience with Jesus that is literally out of this world. And then after that blessing section, if you go to the very end, starting in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10, there's the battle plan. There's the warfare that you and I fight in and we're to stand and be strong and put on the whole armor of God. Because my brethren, you live in a battlefield. It's not a playground. It's not a vacation home. It, it, it is a battlefield. And, and you battle back satanic forces in the world, the flesh and the devil. And we're going to learn how to fight that battle. But in between the blessings, in between the battle are really the behavior of the believer, how you and I are supposed to live. And Paul uses one word, small word, you and I use it all the time, it's walk, how we walk. He says, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding dark and being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness. And literally that means hardness of the heart, that word blindness. It can be both blindness or hardness depending on the context that it's used in. Um, He's saying here, in the old days, one of the things sometimes us preachers get accused of is preaching clothesline sermons. That's when we preach a sermon on modesty and we talk about hemlines that are up too high and necklines that are down too low. And we get accused of that every once in a while. This is kind of a clothesline sermon, though not in that respect. The sermon that, that this is, is really more about, maybe you could call it a closet sermon. Because it's talking about putting off something and putting on something. Maybe you ladies are really like this. My, my wife, for some reason, when she gets ready to go somewhere, the, she's going to spend the most time standing in front of the closet looking at the kind of clothes. And, and inevitably, after we've taken a trip, you know, you'll come back home, and there'll be a pile of clothes that she's taken out and looked at, maybe even tried on and pulled off and laid on the bed. And, and so you take, you've tried it on, you put it on, it doesn't fit, you, you don't like that, that color doesn't go with that color. And, and you're there until you see something that you are pleased with, in the mirror, and then you wear that out. Paul's saying, look in the mirror of the Word of God, find out the kind of stuff that you shouldn't be wearing, and get rid of it. But don't just put it on the bed and stick it back in the closet to go through the cycle. Take that junk out and burn it. Get rid of it. It doesn't belong in your life anymore. The ladies go, man, I can go shopping if I do that. The preacher told me to burn the clothes I don't like. Yes! Yes! I love that preacher! Let's build him a new church! No, I'm just no, I'm not really. Build us a new church. That would be great. Look, look God, God wants us to put off the old man. And he uses some words to, to talk about this old man, about the corruption of the old man, about how this old man is, is running after wrong things. This old man is living and doing wrong things. And those wrong things have no place in the Christian life. So he's saying, get rid of it. Put it off. Destroy it. Don't 
don't do it because you didn't so learn Christ. That's not what he taught you. And the tragedy of the world looking at people who claim to be believers but were not following through with it is that they assume that that's how Jesus wants you to live or lets you live. And that's not at all the truth according to the word of God. So you and I need to live in such a way that we're letting our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father which is in heaven. That we're living as salt to the world so that we're not, we haven't lost our savor, not cast out and trodden under the foot of men. We need to be those kind of men and women in these last days. So he talks about putting off this old man and then he talks about putting on the new man who's created in righteousness and holiness. That, that's a kind of suit that you can wear. You know, that you can put on and be happy that you wore in the suit of righteousness, that, that you're doing right things, that you have an internal holiness that's there that's not manufactured or just put on for show so that other people will go, ooh, ah, like the fireworks we went off. You guys did every 4th of July, ooh, ah. You have to alternate it because you can't say ooh every time. And so some, <laughs> some people, there, there are some people, and you know them, you've seen them, that they put on righteousness only to somehow, it's fraudulent though. It, it doesn't grow on an internal holiness and it's only a show. The word for that is a hypocrite in the Greek. In the Greek there is a word called hypocrite, it's transliterated into the New Testament and it means one who wears a mask. And they would have used it in the early Greek dramas and tragedies and, and comedies and they would have had a mask that had a smile and they would have had a mask that had a frown. And if they were had a smiling part, they put that mask on. If they had a frowning part, they put that mask on. And if you, if you were an actor, you were a hypocrite. You were one who spoke behind a mask. God does not want us to be a hypocrite, one who speaks behind a mask. He wants us to be genuine, authentic, real. People who love God from the bottom of our feet to the top Amen. of our head. Who want to follow God and want to serve God. And, and, and that new suit that we put on is internal, it's external, it's holy in the internal, it's righteous in the external. And it's where we live a brand new way because of our faith in Jesus Christ. Where he's changed us. He's washed us. He's regenerated us. He's redeemed us. And as a result of that, it changes everything. It's the game changer. It makes everything different than it was before where old things are passed away and all things are become new. And then he's going to get into the nitty gritty of what this looks like. So far, so far we're all okay with it. That's good. That's right, man. New. I like new stuff. I don't like old stuff. Throw it away. Now he's going to start talking about some specific areas. He's going to leave preaching and go to meddling. He's going to get in the middle of your business and start talking to you about what you do day in and day out. And he's going to say, Paul was very directional. There's a, there's a big deal in kind of counseling now where it's sort of non-directional counseling so that we sit down and, and the person tells you this stuff. So you tell me all this going on in your life. And I go, hmm, how do you feel about how do you feel about it? And it's all about how you feel about it. It's not whether it's right or wrong, and there's no moral judgments that are made about it. It's just kind of how you feel about that. And, and it's just my job as a counselor to get you to feel really good about whatever it is, stupid stuff you're doing. I'm like, hmm, how do you feel about that? You know, the reality is there's a lot of stupid stuff that we do that we need to stop doing. You know, and the only way your life's going to get better is you stop doing dumb things. That doesn't take a genius, but somehow, in, in modern counseling, even in modern preaching, a lot of it is, let's just all feel better. Yeah. Let's hug each other. Group hug, everybody, come. Come on. <laughs> you know, if you don't stop doing dumb things, you're sabotaging your life, you're sinning against God, you're putting yourself in moral peril. In incredible jeopardy. So look. God, Paul gets very directional here. As soon as he's talking about, okay, he's, he's talking about put up the old man, all that stuff. Now, wherefore, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor. Don't lie anymore. He says, you, you're a believer. You, you, you name the name of Jesus. You want the blessings. You want to be able to fight the battle. Quit your lying. Pretty plain. We, we live in a society where, where instead of God being a very present help in the time of trouble, lies are very present help in the time of trouble. You know, where all of a sudden it gets a little bit dicey and we whip out that lie right there to be able to try to cover our track. Well, the trouble with lying is if you lie a lot, you better have a good memory because you've got to figure out what you told somebody. Well, God don't want us to be lying. He doesn't want you to have to have a good memory. He wants you just to think about what the truth is and be able to tell the truth so that that truth resonates out there and it accomplishes the purposes that, that God has for it. Well, some of the reasons God doesn't want us to lie is lying is ungodly. God is a God of truth. Uh, he's the father of truth, and we need to understand that. And, and so as we put away lying, we're putting away an area of ungodliness that's in our life. 
And why is lying ungodly? It's not hard to understand when you get the true origin of lying. Jesus talking to the Pharisees that were there who claimed to be the sons and daughters of Abraham. What Jesus says to them is this. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lust your father and the lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Do you know what Satan's native tongue is? Deception. It's what he used on Adam and Eve in the garden. It's what he must have used with the other angels as he convinced them to, to fall with him, as he convinced them to go with him against God. Satan is a deceiver, liar. Well, I tell you, how much, how much junk could we get rid of out of our life, uh, mental confusion, if we quit listening to the liar? You know, but he whispers in our ears and he tells us stuff that's not true. And he creates a mental fog, a confusion in there about right and wrong, good and bad, about all that stuff. And, he, and, he, and he's the fiery darts of the wicked that you're going to see in Ephesians chapter 6. He plants them in your mind and he makes you think things that are real that are not and things that, are, that really are real in our walk with God. He makes you confused about that. We've got to quit listening to the liar. The liar's destructive, and we certainly got to quit speaking his language. We got to, we got to learn. Uh, so, lying is ungodly because of its true origin. And then another reason we put away lying is, is what does God think about lying? What does God feel about lying? Listen to Proverbs six. These are called the seven deadly sins. It's a list where, where, where uh, they talk about, you know, in the theological circles, the things that God hates. And it says, it says this in Proverbs 6, 16. These six things that the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, and listen to the second one, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, and heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that are swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among brethren. Two of the seven involve lying. So two out of the seven things that God adamantly hates are lying. So God wants us to speak truth. Very simply, he wants us to learn to be people of truth. Where our yea means yea, our nay means nay, where, where we are speaking the truth in our relationships and with the people that are around us. Not only is lying ungodly, lying is unwise. Uh, when you and I lie, we, we open ourselves up to the punishment of God. Um, Proverbs 19.5 says, A false witness shall not be unpunished. He that speaketh lies shall not escape. A couple of examples come to my mind immediately when I think about God punishing liars. Gehazi in the Old Testament, uh, a servant of one of the prophets, N Naaman came to him to be cured of leprosy. He was told to get seven times in the Jordan River. After a little bit of initial hesitation and, and uh, faltering, he finally does dip down the seven times, comes up, leprosy healed, absolutely cleansed, comes back to the prophet of God and says, man, I've got gold, I've got silver, I've got changes of clothes. Man, I've got this, I want you to have it. And the guy says, no, I don't want it. Uh, and he's going home. Give God great glory. Goes around. Gehazi comes out and goes, hey, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Uh, the prophet changed his mind. He wants you to give, give that stuff to me. I'll be sure to deliver it. Well, he wasn't going to deliver it to him. He, he was going to get it. He, he, he thought he figured out a way that he was going to get ahead in life. And uh, then, do you know what happened to Gehazi? Any of my Bible scholars know what happened to him? He got leprosy. Was that a good trade for him? I'm thinking not. I mean, if you got to choose between uh, this you know, wanting this money really bad and having leprosy, which was essentially a death sentence for you, that was kind of a dumb trade. But because of his lie, he ended up getting leprosy. And then in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 5, you've got Ananias and Sapphira. All, a lot of the people are getting together. They're, they're selling what they have so that they, you know, for the, for the care and upkeep of the church. Ananias and Sapphira get up in front of a church in a meeting and they go, we have sold everything we own and we're giving it all to God. Only they didn't, they didn't give it all to God. They sold everything to all, but they kept back a big chunk of it, apparently, and they end up with the judgment of God on them. They died that day. God takes lying pretty serious. I know society doesn't, but God does. And God's the one you answer to, not society. And so we need to please God. And the way that pleases God is for me to put off lying and put on, in my new closet, wardrobe, honesty. Now, there's a couple of other things that kind of go along in this, in this concept of lying, what we need to do. But one is, and you'll appreciate this. There's uh, antiques, and there's 
there, there's four boys. They, they, they're, they're teen boys. They're in high school, and they, they get spring fever one morning. One morning, they don't go to school. They, they, they skip the morning class. They show up about noon because they, they want to they wanna be reported that they were at school. So they go in and they tell the teacher, you know, our tire had a flat. So we weren't able to be here for the morning classes. And so the teacher well, that's okay. You know, you only missed a, a little pop quiz. You sit down with a piece of paper, go to each corner of the room, and sit down and get your pencil. And then she said, which tire was it? Yeah. yeah, and you're going to get caught, really. You know, and you can use that real quick. If, you, if those kindergartners ever threaten to have a you know flat tire, you can use that. Because you know they're always driving around, and little buggies or whatever the kindergartners drive. Um, look, and then here's a couple of other reasons that you might need to be people of truth. The Christian has a responsibility to truth. I mean, God has given us truth, and then we're to be people who deliver truth to the world. So we can't afford to be liars. Speak every man truth with his neighbor. Uh, and then we also, it's part of our relationship to the body. Not only do we need to be honest for God, but we need to be honest for the other people who are around us. Do we do them any favors if we're lying to them? Do we help them in any way for lying to them? No. We only hurt them when we hurt the relationship. And the relationship suffers, suffers a devastating, devastating blow or dishonesty. Those that are transformed not only have to live, get rid of, dishonesty and lying, they also have to get rid of unresolved anger. Listen to verse 26. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath and the place of the devil. He breaks down four basic reasons, four basic things about anger. First of all, he says, be angry and sin not. That's an unusual thing. He's, he's saying essentially that there are some times when anger is actually beneficial or it's good. Uh, anger, anger is not roundly condemned in the whole in the Bible. In, in fact, you can see Jesus chasing out the money changers in, in one, possibly two incidents in, in, in the Gospels, depending on whether John was a, a, you know, a later uh, chase, chasing out the money changers. But anyway, you certainly see Jesus at times where there was anger in the part of Jesus, but it was a righteous anger, a righteous indignation. You have God in the Old Testament becoming very angry with the children of it, where they were doing wrong things anger in the heart of God. Just like you as parents, when you see your kids living below the level you know they're supposed to be living at, sometimes it makes you angry. When, when they're doing things that, that's not consistent with what, you know, with how they're supposed to live, it, it creates an anger in you because you want, to, you want to stop that nonsense. Well, God had that righteous kind of anger. So he's saying, he's not saying there's never a time to be angry. So we have to go around like, oh, oh, no, be angry, oh, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that, that there is a right place for anger, but it's got to be it's got to be in the right way, at the right time, for the right reason, and directed at the right person. It can't be just willy nilly. I'm mad at everybody. You guys have seen people. You guys have seen people that they're constantly mad at the whole world. I mean, they kind of go around with the. You remember William Conrad with the Ever Ready battery deals and daring people to knock it off his shoulder? Well, that's how they do the whole world. They're like. Knock it off my shoulder. Come on, knock it off. Knock it off. I dare you. Just waiting to get into a fight. That's unacceptable. That's not what we're talking about here. So he says, be angry and sin not. So so there is there is sin in anger if we deal with it the wrong way. And here's a way that we accidentally enter into sin, I think. He says, let not the sun go down on your wrath. If your anger lingers in your heart and it stays in there and you don't deal with it, it will become bad. Even if it was right in the beginning, if you allow that anger to eat you up and to stay in you and it starts spilling over onto other people, you sin now. You're no longer in the be angry and sin not deal. You're now in the sin part of it because you let the sun go down on your wrath and you're carrying yesterday's anger today and tomorrow and so on. Here's the deal. In America, there are a lot, there's a lot of unresolved anger. And it goes, it, it, go, it goes into new. So people will break up in one relationship, they'll break up or a divorce or whatever, and they go, you jerk, I don't like you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to marry somebody else. And you go and you get married to somebody else, and then you find out you brought your anger with you into that current relationship, and all of a sudden you start destroying the relationship that you're in. And then you get a divorce or break up from that relationship and go to another one, and your anger is poisoning every relationship that you have, and all the while, you're going, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault, it's your fault. It's everybody else's fault but my fault. Well, look, if you've had a string, you know, if you lost all your friends, and, you, and you've lost all your relationships, what's the one consistent factor in that equation? You are. And so, and so if you go, well, well, everybody's all messed up. I don't know why the world's that way. Could it be you? 
could it be my anger? You know, we need to we need to really diagnose that because I think it's destroying families. I believe it's destroying every area in society. Our unresolved anger is becoming a problem. <laughs> one guy said, one guy said, I, I, me and my wife, we never let the sun go down on the right. We stay up and fight on my wife. That's, that's not that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about dealing with going to God, confessing. Going to God, confessing your sins, acknowledging that the anger has become a sin, and saying, God, forgive me. Give me peace. Give me love. Oh, we, we do experience sin of anger. Well, we do. We need to be honest about it and say, God, I was angry. I shouldn't have been. Help me to show love in this situation. The kindness, forgiveness that, that you talk about at the end of this book of Ephesians 4. Um, and then he says, Need a good place for the devil. The point I think he's making here, as he's finished out this talk about anger, Right on the heels of it, he says, need to give place to the devil. You want to know how to give the devil an open door into your life? Practically opening up the door, putting a welcome mat out and saying, come on in. There's milk and cookies in my life, devil, is to let anger control you. Do you know what the prisons are populated with? Angry people. Angry. They were in some conflict, a fender bender or something, and their anger got them, and a fight broke out, and they got put in jail. They, they become angry in a domestic situation and started hitting each other and they went to jail. They, they, they were in a gang and the other gang did something to them so they did something back. And these angry people are experiencing incredibly negative consequences. So here's my thinking is if that kind of, you know, if, if the people in prison are angry and I don't ever want to go to prison, I might want to not give place to the devil. I might not want to have that open door where I'm just letting them come in and take over. Have you ever noticed that, that the people, that there are people that try to get you angry? Have you noticed that around you? There's some people that they delight in kind of pushing your buttons, and they'll kind of, they'll kind of intentionally push your buttons. What I try to tell my kids is this, is if you, if you allow them to see your reaction, if you allow them to see an angry reaction, you're letting them control you. So they're a jerk. I mean, pretty much everybody that knows them knows they're a jerk, and they know what they do. And if you let them manipulate you, you're letting them control your life. So you're turning, you're turning the steering wheel of your life. I won't pick on you anymore. I've been doing it all day. So I turn the steering wheel of my life over to somebody else, and I'm saying, I don't like you. You're a jerk. But here, steer my life. You, you determine whether I go to jail or don't go to jail. You determine whether whether my situation is good or bad. You determine how good a deal I'm going to have. I'm going to give that control over to you. Is that very smart? I'm thinking not. I mean, I, you know, I'm not a genius or anything, but I'm thinking that's probably a dumb thing to do. Give me back my steering wheel. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I know it was a good steering wheel, wasn't it? It was a fat boy steering wheel that it worked, you know, I can do it. Sorry. Um. <laughs> and then he then he moves on to another area. He's talking about oh, yeah. very quick. Um he got about not lying, he talked about not getting angry. And then he's gonna talk about not stealing. One guy wrote a letter to the IRS and he said he said <laughs> He said, a while back, I failed to report some income to you. I'm, I'm having trouble sleeping. Enclosed, you'll find $500. If I still can't sleep, I'll send you the rest. I'm not sure he understood about honesty. And he must not have heard a sermon on Ephesians 4, 17 through 31. He didn't get that. Stealing is when we take something that is not ours. They say that every 82 seconds, a robbery takes place in the United States of America. Cars stolen every 30 seconds. Retailers lose more than $7 billion a year to shoplifters. It's estimated that companies lose an additional six billion from employees stealing from their employer. Letting this goal steal no more, but rather letting labor working with its hands that we have to give them. It's fascinating as it begins to break down with this concept of not stealing. It is he doesn't just say don't steal, he says don't steal, do work. He gives you the, the other way to get what you need. God has provided a legitimate way for you to have the things that you need. And that legitimate way for you to have the things that you need is not to liberate it from somebody that's close to you, giving yourself a five-finger discount. The way that you have it is you go, you get a job, and you work, and then when you earn the money, you go down to the store, and there's this little green stuff that nobody uses anymore. It's paper. It's got president's faces on it. And if you take and you give enough of the president, dead president's faces to the person, they will give you that item that you need. And that's, and, but he doesn't, it's fascinating that Paul even goes beyond that. He doesn't even just say, don't steal, do get a job. He says, don't steal, do get a job so that you can have to give to him the need. In other words, he totally shifts your, your thinking away from a selfish kind of an attitude where, where I deserve this, you need to, it, it, you have it, I want it, I'm going to take it. And he moves that from not doing that to getting work so that you can have to give to somebody that's got a need of them. 
That's an amazing shift. I mean, an incredible internal shift on the part of the person. So Paul's saying, be honest, don't, be, don't have unresolved anger, and don't steal. And then he goes on to an area of, of destructive speech, uh, of getting rid of, of destructive speech. Um, he says, uh, he's talking about, uh, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, that which could be used of edifying, but it may minister grace to the hearer. The word corrupt means worthless communication, destructive speech. It could include swearing, gossip, critical words, condemning words. And he said, move from that, move from that to constructive speech. Have you, have you ever listened to yourself? It's really hard to do. Uh, somehow we don't hear ourselves. I, Sandy says, I don't hear myself all because I talk to you all the time. But, but, but suppose, listen to yourself, the kind of words that are coming out of your mouth. What are you predominantly saying? Are you blessing people or cursing them? Are you are you lifting people up and tearing them down? And that's what Paul seems to be getting out of this passage. He's saying you can either be on the destruction crew that's out there using your language to tear other people up, or you can be constructive, building them up, helping them grow in their walk with God, helping them to make it in their daily life. And there are some words that we say that are, that are um, apples. Is it apples of silver and pictures of gold? The pictures of apples of gold and pictures of silver. How's that going? Do you remember? Anybody? What is it? Say Apples of gold and pictures of silver. And it, it means, and, and the, the, a word fitly spoken, that there's a word that's like a, a nail in a, in a place that lets you hold on. And, and boy, we need that kind of language that's helping people hold on, that's a, that is a word in season, that it really helps them instead of all this junk that the society has out there that's just constantly tearing people up and tearing them down. Final thing here. Um, those transform lives, the way that we walk, we're not supposed to grieve the Holy Spirit. Grieve, it, means it speaks of causing a painful swallow. Here's the thing. When we sin, if, if I violate the speed limit, if I go 36 miles an hour when it says 35 miles an hour, I've not offended the law that's on the book. I mean, I, I mean, I, I broke the law, but I've not created a personal offense. Nobody back in Washington is crying because I went 36 miles an hour. When we're sinning, you know, whatever the sin may be, I really hurt the heart of God. It's more, than, it's more than just that I violated one of the Ten Commandments. It, it, it's a level beyond that. It certainly is that you violated the Ten Commandments, that you did something you weren't supposed to do. But there's a level beyond that where I hurt God's heart. So that Peter, when he denies Jesus three times and Jesus looks up at him, Peter's like, oh, man, I, I hurt Jesus. It wasn't just that he denied him. It was, it was that he hurt Jesus' heart. And we're, our Christianity is a love relationship between us and God. It's not, it's not a religion. It's not me trying to work my way into good pleasure, a good favor with God. It's not somehow a flesh thing. It's a relationship where I love Jesus, I love God, and I want to please God. And that's how we need to live. And I think doing that, if we have that right understanding of relationship, we're going to be less likely to hurt God's heart by the way we live. The, the main, uh, maybe the main passage that would describe this is 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away, but all things become new. I, I was reading about a man in Blue who was an alcoholic, and, and he, all the things that come along with alcohol and, and, and a family, spending all the family money, being a jerk, being an angry alcoholic, and all of that stuff that came along with it. And one day somebody presented the gospel to him. Blue got saved, got transformed. And, uh, it, and after, when he got sa saved, he started growing a beard. And two years after salvation, he shaved that beard off, and his little daughter saw him, and she started crying. And she said, she said, I don't ever want you to go back to the living world. You know, I mean, a real transformation took place in his life, and she wanted to grow the beard back. Because she, she pictured the, the, him being clean shaven with all that stuff that took place before, you know. And, and really, God doesn't want you to go back to where I was before. Your family doesn't want you to go back to where you're in there. Over there. This side likes me. That side doesn't like me. I don't like it. Let's see. Let's see. Right, we're in reverse. Every head got an eye closed. But look, I, I don't know what's going on in your heart and your life. But what I do know is that Jesus loves you passionately. And he wants to do great work in your heart and your life. Wants to restore, he wants to forgive. But you've got to come. He already sent us in Christ to die on the cross. He's already given you his word. He's already sent me to preach the word. Now it's your chance to respond to God, to turn to him, to trust in him, come to the altar, and to give your entire life to him.
transform everything, change the direction, and, and give you the inner peace that you've been looking for all the days. But let's pray. Mighty Jesus, as we have an altar invitation here in just a moment, oh Lord, if there's any of here that do not know you for certain, this Lord and Savior, allow this to be the day of their spiritual birth. Allow this to be the day that they commit their life to you, that they turn literally the steering wheel of their life over to you, allowing you to redirect them away from dishonesty, away from anger, away from, uh, away from bad communication, away from hurting your Holy Spirit, and allow them, God, to begin to experience the blessings that are in the first three chapters. Jesus. God, I... I just thank you for allowing us to have this time together, and I pray that you be with us in this time of invitation. In Jesus, you know, every head bowed, right eye closed. If you, if you need to come to this altar and pray about something, whether it's salvation or just to come and rededicate your heart to Him, the altar is open to you. It's a place where you can come and do business with God. Your life can be altered by the altars of God. It can be changed by you committing yourself to Him in a fresh way.